Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv. So ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. Heather, uh, how, how brittle are those hyper, hypoplastic teeth? So we saw those changes in this case where we've got disruption of the normal enamel. The enamel in many cases is uh, decrease in its calcification level. It, it comes off of the tooth when we clean, which is part of the treatment. And in, in that, uh, th they are more brittle. And they can be super brittle where there is trauma to those teeth from other things like chewing bones uh, before we see them, especially in a young patient. And they fracture. So the pulp cavity in young patients, if you've been with us for a while and you've actually, you're through 12 of these cases in the case workshop, you know that indeed there are circumstances where you, you have a young patient uh, and you have this where you look at the x-ray and the x-ray evidence of the pulp cavity diameter is huge. Uh, and that occurs with, with young patients in, in any uh, respect. But if you look at that radiograph, you notice how thin that dentin is uh, on, around the, the pulp cavity, which extends into the crown. So if you compromise it with the decrease in enamel calcification, decrease in enamel quantity, then you're down to dentin or deeper and that makes that tooth very susceptible to fracture. And add to that a young patient chewing bones, and then you've got a, you've got a uh, scenario for potential fracture of that tooth. So that does, uh, that does happen, and they are uh, brittle, if you would, if you use that term, Heather. Uh, they are, uh, I, I don't know that they're more brittle uh, per se, if, uh, as far as that term goes, but that's a good way to kind of describe them, but they are more prone to fracture because the calcification component of that enamel is missing or compromised, and so they're not as, they're not as hard. <clears throat> they're, the two teeth are softer uh, because you're down to dentin. They're more likely to uh, be disrupted uh, from fracture. Allison Marie, during extraction, is it common to have uh, these teeth fracture? Um, I assume they're friable. Are there special types of tools for the extractions? <clears throat> and kind of a similar question, but the more specific part of that is, is it common to have uh, the teeth fracture when you extract them? And they, the crown might, uh, which is not a, not a big deal. We don't re really have a lot of opportunity to extract these because we can restore a lot of them. <clears throat> Many of them that come to us are not compromised yet. We get them less than a year of age. We do the restorations. We do, uh, we do the treatment, which you have seen in the workshop and see how we do that. And we've described that, so we won't go into that here. <clears throat> but you've seen how we approach those. And so we get them young, ideally. We come back and we re-radiograph. And so that's when we tell if we need to extract. And very commonly, we don't run into that because we get them in time and the pulp is still viable. So Haley, Erola, 
I believe is how to pronounce your last name, Haley. <clears throat> Uh, is there a post x-ray of this and how much viable bone was touched during removal of uh, the of the of the removal of the non-viable tooth i assume i put some arrows on the image i don't ha I, we've got a pre or a post op we don't have one that i could put my finger on they're in our records but um, <clears throat> based on your question you can see above that white arrow to the right that there's still that root that distal root of, of that or that root of that tooth that has um, has been compromised from hypoplasia and some pro probably dengen vaginatus or tooth uh, a dengen dente where the crown's kind of enfolded on itself as part of the process <clears throat> and then you've got that area that we pointed to with a blue arrow that's necrosis or osteomyelitis or both and then when you look at the area of contour, which was a question, how do we clean that up? Do we have a post-op? Uh, you know, how do we clean that? The extent of that right, middle, and left arrow apically is where we essentially would have cleaned that up and removed bone and made that just a nice smooth uh, area that is a... Uh, that has bone adjacent to that tooth to the right, the premolar to the right, and has bone caudal to it. And so that cup will fill with bone and uh, be replaced within four to six weeks after we remove the diseased bone and leave that defect there, that cup of a defect. It's got walls there, so it will form, uh, we can form a blood clot in there, suture back, and you will get that, um, that luxury of having bone form back in that defect. So what nutritional deficiency can cause uh, enamel defects? And, and <clears throat> nutritional deficiency in general <clears throat> could definitely cause enamel changes. There are no specific nutrients that we would place in that category that we can, that we can put our finger on but any kind of nutritional deficiency would compromise developmental growth of, of many different things in the body, including formation of the enamel, uh, which happens again at generally from birth to about eight weeks of age <clears throat> that enamel is forming. And that's when we get that enamel hypoplasia that's generalized if it's a traumatic uh, hypoplasia or a what we call uh, a regional, uh, not diffuse uh, involvement of teeth, then that can happen up to 12 weeks of age or so, um, maybe as much as 16, but generally between birth and 12 weeks of age is when, when we expect to see that. So looking, looking at that from a deficiency standpoint, anything nutritionally that you see in that time frame of uh, zero to eight weeks specifically could cause some changes and result in enamel defects or hypoplasia. Kathleen, in this case, similar to what we would expect to see with in utero distemper viral infection, uh, is this associated with fever in the mother that results in the defect? And um, generally the, the distemper it is in the dog itself. It's not. It's not necessarily in utero. Uh, it's. It's in the dog itself. When the enamel's forming after uh, the the mother gives birth to it, other other defects. If the mother had enamel uh, problems with uh, epitheliotropic viruses like canine distemper, would produce. Uh, you know anything that's epithelial skin, mucous membranes. Um, anything that falls into that category is a fair game uh, with, with in utero inf uh, infection. But the majority of these we can attribute to some uh, rise in body temperature, some inflammatory process that causes a rise in body temperature, kills the ameloblast that produce the enamel or the adonoblasts that produce the dentin at birth to that eight-week period. 
<clears throat> so the distemper happens or the rise in, t in temperature or the epitheliotropic virus more specifically in cases of distemper <clears throat> uh, cause this. Now we, we as, as practitioners long ago when distemper was, was a thing, we saw it a lot in unvaccinated dogs, uh, this happened a lot. <clears throat> but now with the fact that we've got education for clients, we've got veterinarians that know that and have, you know, for years known that distemper is a problem, uh, vaccinated against it, we just don't see this very often. And if we do, patient's probably been vaccinated and probably has not had distemper. Uh, you know, the histories are pretty significant <clears throat> that uh, they, they've been vaccinated. So, um, there's there's a good chance that the problem is not necessarily distemper unless it, it happened shortly before these guys were born from an enamel standpoint. <clears throat> Otherwise, you'd have other defects. If we, if we have any rise in temperature during that formation of enamel, those are the culprits, and that usually goes undetected. I, th I think that was another question that we had. <clears throat> you know, when when does this happen and uh, when do, do clients see when the when the when the insult happens are the patients sick usually they're not and especially for the focal hypoplasia where it's trauma from litter mates they're not going to see that they're not going to know why or when that happened <clears throat> so hopefully hopefully I didn't get off on too many tangents there and there's your uh, there's there's another similar question. How long does it take uh, uh, f a fever? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that for them to have hypoplasia to occur. And actually, when I'm thinking about that question now, I do remember seeing something recently where uh, it was in humans uh, thought to be maybe even a couple of days of fever, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure on that. But I don't think anybody knows, especially for dogs or cats and this does occur in cats too and cam this this melinda has a question how fee feasible is this for the general practitioner to correct uh or is it always a referral if you're not doing composite restorations and are really familiar with that then um it's it's not something that you want to do uh, way too time consuming i generally don't do these in one go if this is a generalized enamel hypoplasia and then many times i'm going to do these in two sessions because it's a couple hours worth of very tedious work and four hours is a lot of time uh, to spend doing this so it's uh, it's something where you, you 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 just you get fatigued and it's better not to do it if it's if it's like that i can do extractions for for three hours but um, i could do this for three hours but if i get into extractions for a couple hours and i've got a couple hours left <clears throat> That means it's a super hard case uh, to take two hours to not finish. So I'm going to do it at another time. Super hard is brachycephalic with cups uh, that, that's going to take two hours per side, two and a half hours per side, something like that. If a client, Kevin Kirk, if the client uh, will not do restorations, it's best to monitor them radiographically or extract. Yes, Kevin monitor radiographically. I would say monitor these. If you get them young, monitor them in six months. Uh, again, at 12 months, 18 months, somewhere in that range. And Cindy, do these dogs show any increased sensitivity or oral pain? Usually they don't, but sometimes they do. <clears throat> where they're reluctant to eat and uh, they, they do show signs where they're, they're uncomfortable, but they're probably not going to show it. And so that increased sensitivity is subjective based on the owner's observation of that patient, and that's not always accurate. But they do have sensitivity. I guarantee you they do because we can we can palpate these, or we can take a little uh, a little uh, take our fingernail and run across, or even touch them. I had one uh, that I touched uh, that had had this problem, and uh, that that touch itself. Uh, induced a pain response, a aversion response of the patient recently. So they do feel discomfort even though they don't have it because it's just like us. If we have dent exposure from a cavity <clears throat> or we fracture a tooth and that dent is exposed, we can feel cold. We can feel uh, heat and or cold 
<coughs> or movement across it. And so these guys, they're, they're not unlike us. They have the same nerve innervation to their teeth as we do, so they're going to feel it as well. So uh, good question, Cindy. I hope that is, a, is an answer that you're able to accept on that. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.